This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 107 of Horsemanship Radio brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have the ladies with Monty. We have some ladies from the Pittsburgh Zoo and some from the movies, and Monty gets to entertain them all. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st of the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Coach Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Greetings. Happy spring. <laughs> Happy spring. It is springtime, and I know you're just coming off a of vacation, so I have to keep reminding you, hey, get your head back in here. Oh, get it's your head been back tough. In. First world problem. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm so happy for you, though. So you got to do, have you ever been on a cruise before? Glenn and I have taken several cruises before, and okay. we rather enjoy them. Uh, but this okay. was a little different because we we went on a cruise with a group of yeah. our auditors here on the Horse Radio Network, who are folks who um, decide that they want to support Horse Radio Network through a small donation through P- Patreon. Mm-hmm. And they get to be part of a closed Facebook page who help us um, give us opinions on our shows, help us advance the company, like great ideas, things we're doing right, things we're doing wrong. They're kind of like our little, our guinea pig group. And a whole bunch yeah. of them came along on the cruise with us. So that was kind of cool. Very fun. A bunch of horsey gals and guys. on gals and a guys, cruise. yeah. How many guys, what's the percentage? Got to be high in girls, right? Much higher in gals. We did have... Okay. I think about a half a dozen uh, horse husbands along or Woo-hoo! horse fellows along. So they were well represented. Yeah. All right. There's those horse husbands. Thank you guys. And probably some on their own too. It's a really cool group. And, and thank you auditors for listening. Those that listen to horsemanship radio too. And so, but here's the part I wanted to hear about. You got to go on a ride, not on the ship, <laughs> but you got on. <laughs> now that's yeah, something that to- they have not yet figured out how to put on a cruise ship. Is an right. Movie. That was the Spanish conquistadors who brought the horses <laughs> over here. I wasn't you guys to Florida, but tell it. Tell us about. So it was in Nassau. Is that where you guys were? Yes, we went for a horseback ride on Nassau. Myself and five of my horsey buddies from the ship. Pretty fun. We all signed up to go for a ride on the beach with the. Oh, let me get it right. Uh, Happy Trails Equestrian Center, which is a. Um, Rent a horse place. Tourists come and they pay X number of dollars and they get to go for a guided ride uh, along the beach on Nassau Island. We did a little bit of um, investigating before we signed up. As a matter of fact, we had the proprietor of the Happy Trails Equestrian Center on the Horses in the Morning show several months ago. Uh, Glenn did a lot of checking out on um, <laughs> online, make sure things were, were above board and things like that. And the horses all looked lovely. Uh, we had a lovely chat with her, and she's been in business for many, many years there on Nassau Island. So we felt comfortable that we were patronizing a above-board business that was um, that were good stewards of their equestrian charges. So if somebody, I mean, I love this is one of my getaways because uh, you can really go off the grid when you're out packing or trail riding, but uh, but picking those is critical. I mean, you don't want to go where the horses are starving or we've all probably a lot of us have been on those where the dude who's, you know, at one end of the trail or the other, uh, wants to show his stuff, you know, or tell, <laughs> you know, show how it's, Oh man, you know, and they want to kick the horse around a little bit. And then yeah, people yeah. are looking at you and rolling their eyes, like, don't do it. Don't say it. Don't, don't tell them, <laughs> you know, and, and, right. Yeah. Is it nose to tail or how do they, um, how do they do? It, it was nose to tail for lack of a better term. Um, but the horses were all, it was very interesting. The horses were all quite polite and perfectly willing to leave um, a half a horse length or a whole horse length or more between each other. Mm-hmm. They weren't, you know, clinging to each other. They were just strolling along like, yep, oh, walking through the neighborhood. Do, 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 Good. They do it all the time. Yeah. And they didn't do the accordion thing where, whoop, we got 20 feet ahead and then no, catch up. Not and much. Bit, yeah. One of the horses nice. is prone to walk slow, trot and catch up. And this is kind of a cu- funny story. 
uh, the gal who got to ride that particular horse, um, one of the comments that the uh, one of the wranglers said, the fellow in the back whose name was Duke, um, he said, you know, <laughs> that horse likes to do that. And he commented about how it was really good for the horses to go for a trail ride and be ridden. You know, it's the same trail ride they do every day, but be ridden by people who know mm-hmm. how to ride because that gives the horse some relief. The horses enjoy being ridden by someone who knows yeah. how to ride well. And the horse that likes to go slow and trot up and go slow and trot up got to be reminded by somebody who knows mm-hmm. how to ride really well that this is the more mm-hmm. appropriate thing to be doing. And it was beneficial to the horse, which I thought was kind of cool. That is cool. That is cool. Yeah. And, and the ones that want to reach, you've got timing on those ones that would reach for the grass. and <gasps> Oh, mine snuck, a, <laughs> mine snuck a bite in. I wasn't paying attention. I was so nervous. Oh. <laughs> You got caught. I got caught off guard because I was just sitting there like a lump watching scenery go by. (laughs) Talking. That's always so embarrassing when he looks back. Right when you're like, oh, no, I was really watching all the rest of the time, I promise. But (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's really fun. So thank you for the tips on how to vet them out. So it sounds like you really... You yes. did your homework online. You talked to the people. You really wanted to know that it was good. And then ultimately, you never know until you get there. But you were you were glad to hear that there are those happy trails. They, were, they were very welcoming. We could wander anywhere we wanted to on the entire farm, go pet them in, in their stalls if we wanted to. And we poked around the tack room. And yeah, they were very open and engaging. Yep. Good. Okay. Well, we're, we're building a little database of the best places to go. And <laughs> it's hard to find. It. They're hard to find now because there's so, well, so few left. Yeah. 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 They're hard to pr- maintain. I imagine it's yeah. not a business I'd want to be in. $40 actually, but... a bale for hay. There you go. There you go. Well, let's get into today's. I'm excited to hear from Barbara Baker from the Pittsburgh Zoo and Janet Rose, who's just been um, a supporter of hers and has worked with uh, the chimps at the zoo as yeah, well. And uh, this is kind of cool. Very cool. And she has a horse sanctuary, too. And they all joined Monty Roberts for a roundtable. This is a part one and a part two, because we had such great conversation that we couldn't stop. Your horse is your partner in sport, in leisure, and just in life. To keep him at his peak performance and optimal health, a solid nutritional foundation is key. Ideally, horses are able to graze fresh, growing grasses, which most closely mimic their natural diet. But that may not always be possible, and we may need to supply some of those missing ingredients in today's diets and provide more functional foods. One component of a horse's diet that is often underfed are omega-3 fatty acids. While more prevalent in fresh forages, harvested forages are lower in omega-3 fatty acids due to their more advanced maturity. Obviously, grasses and legumes have to grow to a sufficient height in order to be harvested, while foraging patterns of horses show great preference for shorter, less mature plants. That's why modern horsemen and horsewomen trust Omega Horse Shine to provide a powerful, bountiful source of omega-3 fatty acids for their equine partners. Look for Omega Horse Shine from Omega Fields at your local tack and feed supplier, or you can find them online at omegafields.com. Montana horsewoman and television journalism veteran Janet Rose is the founder of Horse Haven Montana, a nonprofit horse rescue and adoption center in the Paris of the American West called Missoula, Montana, and it's home to the Equus International Film Festival that she also founded. She's a former executive director of International Wildlife Film Festivals and currently a director of development and communications for Save the Chimps and a member of the Equine Experiential Education Association. And we also have Barb. Barbara Baker, president and CEO of the Pittsburgh Zoo. Barbara's a visionary in the zoo arena. She's a veterinarian and not the least in importance, a horsewoman through and through. She competes too. Barbara competes in barrel racing and is a maverick in her introduction of equine communications into the zoo environment. Can't wait till you hear that. Pittsburgh may be the only zoo in the world incorporating equine communications training and working with horses to help people who work with wildlife. Barbara requires every single staff person to go through the extensive program of working with horses, even if they've never been off a city sidewalk. And it's had an overwhelming impact. 
We also have Monty Roberts as our third guest today with them. And this past year, Monty Roberts was named Horse and Hound Magazine's top 50 all-time greatest horsemen. Monty is the creator of the world-renowned and revolutionary equine training technique called Join Up. He travels the world demonstrating that nonviolent, gentle training, creating breakthrough performance with horses is the way to go. Monty believes that learning the language of Equus ramps up the fun of learning with your horse. Well, welcome. I have three icons of the equestrian and animal world, really, with us today. Welcome, Barbara Baker. First, you. Thank you for being on, with us on Horsemanship Radio. Oh, I'm really excited about it. Very good. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on it. And Janet Rose, welcome back. Glad to have you back. Thank you. Oh, I'm I'm super excited to join you again. Absolutely. Good. And on a different subject, too, this will be really interesting. People will have to go back and listen to your original episode that you were on, but we're on a, just a kind of a tweak, a different plane today, and uh, you, you have lots of interesting aspects to your life. We get to hear mm-hmm. some of that today, too. And Monty, Dad, how are you? I'm fine, and I'm excited to be on with each of you. Um, as you know, I'm obsessed with knowing more about this world of animals and um i just i just can't learn fast enough and mm-hmm. i recently have come up with some uh information that is quite astonishing and we just haven't given these animals credit enough during our lifetime but uh, it's exciting to be with you and and each of you have your areas of expertise that i admire very much well, I'm just going to be a facilitator here. Thank you for that, because I think the the um, experiences that you have between you all, which we just introduced you uh, to the audience about, to our listeners, is going to be self-explanatory. But what you say to each other is totally unscripted at this point. We don't know exactly all the different parallels that you have and intersections that you have in your worlds, but we kind of want to know. We want to listen in on uh, equine behavior and how it affects your staff, Barbara, and mm-hmm. I would love—I would love to hear how you incorporate uh, some of your horse horsey background into uh, why you think that's a valuable uh, skill for your staff. And Janet, you've worked with the chimps and you've worked with horses, so there's that. And Dad is—you uh, know—he's a curious curious animal guy of all kinds. And I would love to hear about some of the intersections with wild animals and your deer and how the deer have taught you, you know, that flight mechanism have taught you so much that you brought into the horse world. So Barbara, tell us, I know you're in Pittsburgh and, uh, yeah, yeah, and you are working at the zoo today. So tell us a little bit about, um, like what's going on today? You just were t- talking about these tiger cubs and tell me what exciting things that you get to do during the day that um, just whet our appetite with the kind of the level of wild that you work with. Well, it's funny today of all days, it's actually a beautiful 61 degrees in Pittsburgh. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been through an incredible deep freeze over the last 10 days. So everybody and their brother is out running around the zoo today uh, just to have the opportunity to get out. We are hand raising uh, two tiger cubs, two very valuable tiger cubs, actually, to the North American population. We imported uh, the female and male into uh, the states from uh, St. Per- Petersburg, Russia, to bring a new bloodline in. And unfortunately, the mother, although she took care of the cubs initially and licked them off and cleaned them all up nice and pretty, uh, then she proceeded to walk out of the nest box and never went back in again. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we are hand-raising these particular animals, and they're about four months old now. And so since it was such a pretty day, we decided to put them out on uh, one of our yards, actually on our leopard yard, and let them run around and play and have a great time out in the sunshine before it got nice and cold again. So we had a great time. Uh, as literally, I believe there was as many staff up looking at the tiger cubs playing around in the yard as there were uh, visitors today. So it was a lot of fun. So you never know what might happen at the zoo on any given day. <laughs> Yeah, that would be pretty exciting. I mean, you you probably don't have too many of the big cat family birth right there either, right? 
Well, so actually, we specialize in yeah, we specialize in endangered and threatened species. So we mm-hmm. actually have some of the rarest cats here in the world. Uh, we have mm-hmm. Amur leopards, uh, and we bred those very successfully, as well as Amur tigers uh, and uh, clouded leopards, and you know, so a lot of different cat species here that do actually quite well in this uh, colder weather climate. Mm, that is fascinating. Okay, we've got to get out there. That's that's mm-hmm. on the bucket list for 2018 to come see this uh, amazing zoo. What sets your Pittsburgh Zoo a- apart? Why did they bring them from from Russia to you? Well, actually, we were looking to set up a new breeding program here at our zoo. And a lot of the cats within the United States were related. And so we needed to bring in a new bloodline and a new uh, opportunity uh, to mix up the genetics a little bit. And so that's what we're looking at on these particular animals. And they they have bred quite well here. We actually have tigers from this particular breeding uh, all across the country. Mm, Great. Now, Janet, how did you and Barbara meet? (laughs) How did we meet, Phoebe? <laughs> um, you know, well, I don't even know if Barbara knows. I was going to say if you could share the story. story. And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I knew about Barbara and the Pittsburgh Zoo for eons. Um, and and from time to time tried to uh, make a connection with her, but didn't find the right way in. Um, but I was familiar with the zoo because it's really one of the most innovative zoos in the country, if not the world. And um you know, it's 77 acres, give or take, although now it is larger than that, about five to 10 more acres. But in that space, it has, it's just so innovative in terms of conservation, in terms of exhibitions. So whenever I went to Pittsburgh, which was very frequent, that was my number one destination always. And what I always loved about it was that I felt like I could be lost in the exhibits, with the species, with the animals, and you really feel like you're transported. So it was a zoo. It was an institution that I always wanted to work with. And I will tell you honestly, and you and your audience can really relate to this. So I think I had had almost my last interview, and I was in Barbara's office, and I sat down, and there was a beautiful saddle just sitting on a saddle rack right there. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have come to the right place. <laughs> and then I learned that they had this, the only one of its kind, as far as I know, in the world using equine training, equine communications to enhance our relationship with wild animals and subsequently with people as well. And so, you know, this zoo has always been groundbreaking. And Barbara has always been, I guess, what we would call a maverick, you know, paving the way. And so the fact that they incorporate and she understands the role of equine communications in how we deal with wild animals, you know, so that's that's kind of my the backstory into it. Um I was the head of development and development um, and then conservation initiatives as I stayed on there with the zoo. But it was the equine program that really just grabbed my attention. I said, oh, my gosh, the whole world needs to know about this because it was having a huge it is having a huge impact. Yeah. Yeah. No. So and Janet's background, you ride horses, you have you are inspired by horses to uh, well, you have a sanctuary and the Equus International Film Festival actually is a <laughs> fundraiser for that. So I know you're passionate about your horses, but it's the language that really I think you three are mm-hmm. intrigued by. And I'm right. curious, Barbara, what, how much background on Monty do you have? Well, actually, it was interesting. It all started with Monty. So I'll be uh, happy to tell you that. I was reading uh, Monty's book and I was particularly in our particular case, at that time, we were looking to figure out a way to have people understand the history of what we were dealing with uh, at that time with elephant management, where we were going from the old school elephant management, uh, which was very similar to breaking horses. And so I was reading Monty's history about how he came through, uh, you know, through the ranks of, of trying to change the culture of people from going from the old school idea of breaking horses to developing a relationship and and training and developing a partnership with a horse. And uh, all of the trials and tribulations that he went through uh, over the course of your lifetime. Mm 
And so it was really interesting because I'm reading this, and li- this is literally like the four law, four words. You know, it's not even actually part of the book, but it's ho- it's the whole part before the book. And I'm reading it, and I'm like, wow. I mean, you could you could change the word horse and put elephant here, mm-hmm. and this would be the same thing we're struggling with so hard to change the culture about how we want to work with these magnificent animals in our care. And so I started reading the the book, and I thought, well, why did, what if we were able to to take these uh, you know ideas and the philosophies and expound on those and bring those into our program here at the zoo? And so, uh, and that's what we've tried to do. We we initially started out with our elephant program here at the zoo because that's really where we work uh, very similar to what you do with horses, particularly at Liberty. Because we, you know, we don't have a we don't have a halter or a rope or a leash or anything like that on, you know, a lead rope or anything like that on our elephants. Our elephants all worked at Liberty, and yet uh, our philosophy here is to develop a relationship and a partnership, and to have this this animal that can weigh, you know, eight to eleven thousand pounds. Mm-hmm. And have that animal work with us and want to do what we're asking rather than being forced to do what we're asking. And so it was funny. It, it actually literally it actually started by simply, uh, you know, picking up a great book and reading it and uh, rereading it and making all kinds of notes on it. And I still have it. I'm looking at it here in my bookshelf in my office and, and really taking those principles and those ideas of that change of culture. And I literally used it as an example. I printed out various different pages of it and shared it with leaders in the zoo industry, industry talking about, look, you know, it takes time. It's going to take energy. There's going to be people that are going to be detractors. Don't focus on the detractors. Focus on what we're going to try to accomplish. And let's see if we can change this culture. And that gradually is happening. Good. I'm glad to hear that. That's got to warm your heart, Dan. What do you think? What do you think? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, um, I'm a kid in a candy shop right now. And uh, I, I have to admit quickly uh, for this audience, uh, especially these two ladies, um, that I have been obsessed with the flight animal. I've been obsessed with the prey mm-hmm. animal um, throughout my life. Um, that just means that I specialize in that, but I have always valued finding the other side and determining why my animals work the way they do based upon the predator that formed their life and their habits and their behavioral patterns. It's absolutely essential that any of us that are interested in one side of this issue also knows the other side because they are so intricately placed and they, they're so dependent upon one another. And I'm so excited uh, to speak with particularly Barbara at this point in time, because I've never met her before, but to hear her say these words is so gratifying. And At this moment in time, I'm working on what I believe is my final book um, because more has happened to me since I met the Queen of England than happened before I met the Queen of England. And so the new book will try to give that side of it, um, the issues that I had to meet in this world of ours, whereby the most often heard sentence was, look, you can tell me I'm wrong, but you can't say my daddy was wrong. Uh, he was the best horseman that ever lived, and he knew that whooping him was all right, and he whipped on me, and it didn't hurt me either. So buck up. You're just a wuss. And I've heard this kind of thing so much. Um, it's It's sad, really, that the human race can be so entrenched in one aspect of what our world is all about, that they could make statements like that. But in fact, they can. And my my <clears throat> method of taking this to the world has been to demonstrate it rather than to try to talk about it that much, because the horses are so 
wonderful in their responses that it doesn't matter. They don't even have an accent as you go around the world. Um, mm-hmm. It's not that they just have the same, you can't say language, but communication system. It's not that they just have the same communication system. It's that they don't even have an accent. And with 47 or 49 or 51 million years, um, 47 of which uh, saw no uh, human being available, we, we owe it to ourselves to understand this. And if only our world leaders could learn more about both sides of this issue, the tiger and the horse, um, we wouldn't have the kind of bullying and and horrible actions that we have with specially made airplanes that can fly bombs over places and kill hundreds of thousands of people with one whack. Mm -hmm. For what? What are we trying to do with ourselves? And the animals have a greater input to that than any human being has ever given them credit for. Mm -hmm. And if, um, you know, I learned something just yesterday about wolves, for instance. And I never knew, all through all my education, I never knew that wolves could prey, stack up, uh, bulk up in numbers, and then prey on other predators, like a bear, and kill the bear. Uh, I never knew that. And why? Well, bears eat salmon. And wolves eat salmon and they're reducing the competition. I guess I don't know. Mm. I would love to know more about it, but I'm having such a hard time to learn everything I need to know about the flight animal that there's very little time to do otherwise. Yeah. yeah. I, the, the flight animal, I just, the flight, sorry, I, sorry to interrupt, but I was going to say the flight animal. I just, go ahead. Go. Oh, it is probably the least understood in a lot of ways because we're carnivores. People are around dogs and cats, uh, but how many people are really around the flight animal much anymore? Uh, no, we're, 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 we're obsessed. We're obsessed, Debbie, with causing the horse or other flight animals to think the way we do, mm-hmm. and uh, he'll be all right. Just tie that bugger's legs together and slap him on the ground a few times, and he'll be all right. That's what they do with their kid and their wife, too, in the caves. Mm. Um, wasn't even against the law. And in many par- parts of the world right now, it's not against the law. Uh, I travel through the Middle East quite a bit, and oh my word, uh, how we misunderstand things. And um, if, you know, I'm so obsessed with learning more about the flight animal. The night that I had grandma tell me that it was my eyes. That's your dear. My my eyes. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, you've been six months trying to touch my shoulder. Would you ever stop and think about the fact that when you reach to touch my shoulder, you snap your eyes on the place you're going to touch and I'm gone for a week. When will you learn? And the, the, the greatest teacher that I had was failure because one night I reached to touch the shoulder and I thought, if I look at that spot, she's going to go because she had gone already about 20 different times where it took me a week each time <laughs> to get back again. Yeah. So my eyes stayed where they were. I knew where the shoulder was. I could see it out of the corner of my eye. I didn't have to snap my eyes and look at it. And what do you know? I rubbed her shoulder. Now, the scientists all told me that unless you incarcerate a a wild deer, you can't break through the wild bubble. You can't get close enough to ever touch them. So nobody has ever touched a deer unless it was in a pen where it couldn't get away and you touch it to show them that it won't hurt. So I I bought it. And that's okay. Uh, You can't touch a wild deer that's stayed in the wild all of its life. And it's not true. I have 14 now that I rub and cajole 
constantly when I'm home and I'm not home enough to really get it right. But yeah, I mean, Kim and, and, and two rubies, uh, Ruby one and Ruby two <laughs> and little, little blue, they will all let me rub them all over. And the scientist will say he's a lion sack because <laughs> he's had them in a pen somewhere or he couldn't, and I can't prove a negative, but, the scientists have it wrong. They never touched grandma's shoulder. They, I have a scientist in Sydney, Australia, that says there's nothing to do with your eyes. The use of your eyes has nothing to do with the behavior of a horse. Okay, my friend, keep thinking that way because uh, you will never take a step forward and get any closer to what I know about horses if you constantly think that way. Mm. And, and to talk to Barbara and to hear those words and to realize that there's people out there that just read my words and had an open enough mind to track my thoughts is so gratifying. You just have no idea how mm. gratifying it is. I don't care what the little kids, we'll get the kids, they'll come along and follow us if there's enough Barbaras in the world. Mm. And uh, you you can take pride in what you're doing and you operating on both sides of this animal issue is, is just so uh, intensely interesting to me because I know so little about the tigers and I love dogs, uh, but my understanding of the predators is, 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 is limited completely. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that no one of us has the right to say you must, or I'll hurt you to any other creature, animal or human. And I've, I've lived that way from an extreme violent upbringing to the point where I wanted to be violent. I desperately wanted to be violent. And, uh, I had a teacher that helped me and, and, uh, I had a family that helped me see the, uh, the, the hypocrisy in that and, mm-hmm. and the, 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 the absolute ineffective way of living that way. Um, and, and, and it, I think the last couple of years have been the learningest years of my life and the Barbara's and the, and the Janet's of the world are the ones that have helped me learn because they've shown me that it's important. Barbara, do you work with your staff uh, on eyes? Well, what we worked on, what we worked on initially, we we initially started the program. It's interesting, uh, Monty's comments, because we initially started the program with our elephant staff and and we trained and worked with our elephant staff uh, with horses. Uh, But then the rest of the animal care staff um, started watching. They said, well, we want to be involved in this, too. And we decided that maybe this might be something that we were looking for a way to evolve the next generation, the next level of animal care in our facilities, in, in zoos all across the country, in the world, for that matter. And so we wanted to look at that. And so literally we started working with each one of the various different departments. And then, um, you know, and Monty, I'm sure can relate to this. We turned around and we found out this is a wonderful tool from a standpoint of teaching people about building a relationship, about working with an animal. They don't know the language. (laughs) You know, a lot of people that work with horses with us have never been on the end of a lead rope with a horse on the other end of it in their lives. Okay, Barbara, hold that thought and stop right there. Let's take a break and hear from Cavallo, our sponsor. And we'll be right back with part two of this fascinating chat. Hi, Carol Herter here, president of Cavallo, home of the world's most trusted and popular hoof boots. You know, one of the most interesting parts of what I do is the many horsey stories I get to hear. Most of them are really uplifting. Some are stories of challenges and a few are downright sad. Recently, a wonderful woman took the time to approach us at a show to share a story about her horse who went down in quicksand. It started out as a really scary story. We were holding our breaths, waiting for the outcome, and it turned out wonderful. 
They winched the horse out relatively unscathed, albeit, you know, a little traumatized. And everyone standing around were super amazed that he still had his Cavallo hoof boots on. Scary story with a good ending. Another testament to Cavallo. If you don't have a pair for your horse, it's time. Cavallos are easy to put on, easy to take off when you want to take them off, and they stay on. They stay on in all terrain. Cavallo, the world's most trusted hoof boots. This is a wonderful tool from a standpoint of teaching people about building a relationship, about working with an animal. They don't know the language. <laughs> you know, a lot of people that work with horses with us have never been on the end of a lead rope with a horse on the other end of it in their lives. And, uh, you know, and, and they're learning uh, how to build, uh, how to become a leader, how to better their leadership skills how to build a relationship with an animal as in working as a partner as opposed to, you know, as a, as a, as a dominant uh, being, you know, perhaps you might think of it as assertive as rather, as, rather than aggressive. And so it's, it actually quickly spread through our whole entire zoo, even to the point where we now, um, you know, we have four training sessions a year and we actually work with uh, every department in the zoo and they're book solid. So it's really a lot of fun because even our, our CFO has been to the training and our human resources director has been to the training and, mm-hmm. you know, all of our keeper staff have been to the training and, and uh, continue to go because we offer one section that's, you know, beginners and one section that's continuing education. And so they, they get a chance to constantly work on their leadership skills, their relationships relationship skills, you know, not just with horses, but with each other, with their children, with their husbands, with their colleagues, you know, with their friends. And uh, it's really, you know, made everyone think out of the box, certainly from a standpoint of what we're doing with animal care and, you know, how we want to continue to evolve that animal care and, com- and continue to do everything we can to improve the, the welfare and care of the animals. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's it's been a lot of fun to see the enthusiasm and the excitement, you know, about uh, the team at large because um, we we now have over a hundred people on our staff who have uh, gone through the training. That's amazing. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Janet, Janet, I should bring you in here too because I'm curious <laughs> about chimps. Like I'm thinking flight and fight. I don't know where chimps are. Well, you you have horses. Well, where do you put them? Well, just I'm going to get to that in a second, but just to kind of echo what you've been saying about the equine program at the zoo. I mean, that Mm -hmm. was really to see how staff members who um, have never been around horses, maybe have never even have been around animals generally, other than maybe taking a walk through the zoo, who (laughs) were terrified. I mean, I had people in my department who were terrified. They didn't like the smell. They didn't like the idea, what they thought it was going to be. And they came back at the end of those two days, literally beaming. They were changed people. They had an understanding simply by the opportunity to work with horses. So, you know, when you talk about changing lives, whether it's animal lives or human lives, we saw it every time they went through that program. So getting to chimps, the chimps are really, chimpanzees are very, very interesting. I didn't know, well, I knew a modest amount about chimps before I went to work at this sanctuary. What was unique about this experience was that these were chimpanzees who had been through some of the most, Monty, you know, if you talk about your life as a child and the abuses you've suffered I would have to say that it's fairly comparable, I mean, not comparable yeah. human being, but I mean, comparable in terms of what they were exposed to that ran counter to what would have been their natural behavior, natural yeah. needs for companionship, um, for interaction, for communication. I mean, since the chimpanzee is so genetically related to the human, they say 98 yeah. I think 98.6%. So they have the same emotions or similar emotions, similar needs. They're but omnivores. What aren't these, they? Yes, I believe so. Um, it's yes, kind of funny mm-hmm. because it's, 
because at the sanctuary, you know, the, the people tended to be very vegetarian. And I would say, and they would say, well, maybe you don't want to serve meat. I would say, yeah, but the chimps eat meat. So why wouldn't we serve meat? But anyway, yeah. the, the most significant thing, I think that the researchers who worked at the sanctuary worked with these chimps, some of them for over 20 years would say about them, and certainly we've seen, is how resilient they are. Mm -hmm. You know, given improved conditions, given the opportunity to have their needs met, they are so resilient despite a lot of what they've been through. And very often, um, I've seen that with, because we do rescue, equine rescue, um, we see that a lot with horses as well. Um, that given the opportunity to heal emotionally and physically, and I have I have one horse that is almost a microcosm of that. I mean, he has indentations, hairless spaces on his face where the halter was never removed for yeah. years. Yeah. He lived alone. He was completely internal. We've seen that, you know, of course, with children and, and people. And within a couple of years, the external and the internal, I would have to say they've healed. He is a chatterbox. When he yeah. sees not only myself, but other people coming, he talks to them. He runs to them. He interacts with them. And he's a little more cautious, I would say, with other horses, but he still gravitates. So the healing and the resilience that I've seen in chimps and horses, I mean, the chimps are far more, obviously, far more aggressive. They're a predatory animal, and they tend to be, the, I think the most unique thing I found about chimps is how emotional they are, where we might go from zero to 10 in anger or emotion, you know, over, let's say, two minutes. They're almost instantaneous. And so you are dealing with a very a very intense emotional species. Um, but, you know, it's just a very unique species. So you have to communicate with them somewhat differently. Yeah. Horses are really horse predictable, Janet. Are, are, are chimps predictable like that too? I no, realize no, no, not predictable. I mean, some, it's very mm -hmm. individual. I, I actually, when I had gone to um, work with the chimps, somebody, our curator of mammals, at the Pittsburgh Zoo said to me, you know, a lot of people don't like to work with them in zoos, he said, because they have such, so they have so much personality. They have very unique personalities, very different personalities. And so they're very, very different from one chimp to another. But when they, when they react in anger or fear, it's intense. I mean, they may take a toe off they may, I mean, they go for the jugular, so to speak. <laughs> so um, it's very important um, in terms of putting them together in family groups. It's very, very, very important to understand the individual. Um, so not unlike people. Yeah, horses, the, word I think, volatile, are a more... the word volatile keeps coming oh, yes. to, to, to my mind. And our horses are so slow to reach volatility. Well, uh, I'm assuming that the chimp is almost in instantaneously volatile if something uh, happens that they don't like. Um, and I, I mean, human beings aren't so far off that, you know. Um, <laughs> Some, right? We, yeah, a lot of them are. And uh, I keep saying that the easiest horse to work with is the horse that needs a friend the most. And if I can get these otherwise considered uh, remedial horses and, and they've never had a friend, they've only had a foe in humans. Mm -hmm. If you can just get through two sentences of, I'm not going to hurt you, they just fall in love immediately and, and they will do anything for you because they've found a friend. And uh, I just received a horse in Germany that was trained by a leading trainer in Europe who has been the European champion trainer for many, many times in the past 20 years. 
and he had a horse that they could not get near for three months. The halter had grown into his head. Um, they couldn't get near him with the saddle. They couldn't touch his head. They couldn't touch any leg. Uh, they couldn't get near him. And they brought him to me, and unfortunately, I only had four days to send him back to the guy I was leaving for Hong Kong. And in four days, I could have him put the bit on himself, and I just put it over his ears, and then I could put the saddle on him, rider on him, and have him walk, trot, and canter in four days. Because when he said at about 45 minutes into it on the first day, I found a friend, he just took me on like I was his long-lost uncle. And... uh it it was absolutely phenomenal. I don't have enough of it on tape, but um, it was one of the most incredible changes that I've ever seen. And it, it, you just stop and say, I got that right. What did I do? And you have to go back over everything that you did. What was the first and, thing you did? What was the first thing you did with him? Well, the first thing I did was um, to manage to touch him through almost... Uh, uh, a forced thing where we had several people and we could push his hips away so he couldn't kick you and I could protect myself so he couldn't strike me and, and get that halter off of him that was yeah. hurting him and get on a, a big halter that wouldn't cause pain to his head. And then to simply bring his head to the door where I could protect myself with the door and start rubbing his mm -hmm. head and, and he would strike out with his front feet and try to break my arm when I did it. But as soon as he saw that my hand could go there and not cause pain, he started to come my way and I took him to a round pin and did join up mm -hmm. and he locked on to me as if, you know, I was his father. And, um, he, uh, went from there step by step right on through the thing till the first day I was already saddling him and, uh, you know, causing him pleasure instead of pain. And, um, it's just a matter of which P you, you use. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you worry about putting him back in that environment after the four days? Do I worry about it? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I can't sleep with those things. And I, I send messages through, but I, I went on to Hong Kong and worked with a horse there that, oh my God, Ray Charles could see what they were doing wrong. And this poor horse was <laughs> desperate. And I showed them what was wrong. And I came home and the trainer went right back doing this, the very same thing he did before and, and telling the owner that he was perfectly confident that he could, he could get this horse right. And the horse was worth $30 million if he was <laughs> right. And about $200 for dog food if he was wrong. And he's wrong. And mm -hmm. now the owner, I had a word with him last night on the telephone, is probably going to change, finally, uh, trainers. But I don't know if he's gone too far to ever make the change. But he runs half a race and then just stops and won't go f further. Mm -hmm. And he won 300000 in two races before going wrong. Um, and, and the man was fined $5,000 for whipping him with an electrified whip. So he keeps looking to the human to cause him pain. And, yeah, uh, that's it. The trust. Barbara, have you ever experienced a join-up? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, many, many times. And it's a lot of fun. We we um, uh, have been successful in so many different kinds of species here that you can think of. Um, I mean, we have, for example, diabetic tiger that willingly comes to the to the uh, mesh and gets their insulin injections. You know, so we've had uh, uh, we had an infant gorilla who was four months old when he all of a sudden was getting lethargic. Mom had been taking great care of him up to that point. He was doing great. And then all of a sudden we come in and he's starting to get lethargic. And over a couple of days, he's just kind of hanging there. And so uh, we got mom, we traded, we traded mom a, a banana for the youngster. And uh, she allowed us to take him out of out of the enclosure, and we were able to find out that boy, the little guy was starving to death. That she had run out of milk, oh, and uh, was not no longer uh, able to supply the milk. So we were able to uh, get the the youngster on the bottle, 
And then we're able to train him to go up the mesh and to take his milk through the mesh. And then we were able to put him back with the whole troop, including his mom, who was happy to have him back. She just didn't have any milk. And then every day he would come over to the mesh and get his uh, bottle because he trusted the humans. He trusted the keeper staff that he was working with. And he was able to get his bottle and to go happily off and be a gorilla. And so, uh, yeah, we, it's really neat to see the evolution of how animal care has really changed uh, and it continues to change, uh, you know, with everything that Monty's done and everything that people are doing all across the country to try to, you know, to build partnerships, relationships and, and help these animals uh, and, and make their lives, you know, more enjoyable. Boy, how I need a letter from you for this next book that I'm doing, because (laughs) this is exactly what I want the readers uh, to know, is that it isn't just my ideas. It's it's palpable and learnable, and the world is going to change. It's just a matter of time, and uh, you you could really help me do that. Well, the interesting thing is the the animal some of the animal rights folks um, who are are certainly well intentioned um, t- seem to have taken the human out of humane, and mm-hmm. we believe very strongly that the human animal bond that we have with our animals, based on a partnership, based on positive uh, experiences, based on based on us uh, understanding each other and the needs of each species. Uh, you know, it's very, very positive. And it's it, that human experience and that human relationship, uh, as Monty so clearly points out, is based on the animal. You know, uh, most animals are looking for leadership. And even we find with our prey animals, while they might not be looking for leadership, uh, they're looking for ways to partner. Uh, mm-hmm. Even as even as a you know even a tiger or a lion is looking for a way to partner, mm-hmm. and so uh, you know that's so very very important to providing uh, you know good quality animal care that uh, you know uh, and to to remove to remove that human out of humane and to remove the humans out of the equation really scares me because we're yeah. losing so many magnificent, wonderful animals in the wild. That's true. And, uh, you know, if we lose them in captivity as well, uh, it would just be such, such an incredible loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you and, know, and so that, it's so true, but I, I really see flight animals looking for a leader. Uh, absolutely. I really see that. And I, I can show you gestures that they make that clearly state where are we going with this? I don't know where this goes, but can you show me, is this going to be all right for me? And Mm -hmm. I think that's looking for a leader. Um, I think it's not unlike a one-year-old child, uh, you know, who may be in a, in a very difficult situation, like raised in the mountains or something uh, that they really need an adult to show them uh, how to be okay and Mm -hmm. where to go to get help. And I think our horses are saying that a lot. Right, and so are you know, elephants, Debbie, and so are, are giraffes, mm-hmm. and all of our other animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would Janet. love to sit. I would love to sit down with you and your favorite mm-hmm. half dozen people oh, in good. these areas and just share some mm-hmm. uh, some thoughts on these things. It would be mm-hmm. wonderful. Janet, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, as I'm listening to everybody's input and. You know, what Barbara's saying in terms of animal rights versus animal welfare versus what we're trying to do to save species because we are going to lose many of them in the wild. And so those that are in, quote, captivity may may be our last ditch effort. What we've seen so often is that those who, as Barbara says, they may be well-meaning, but those who take who talk about animal rights are very often those who really do not understand animal communications, certainly equine communications, but how these wild species think, act, communicate, interact, needs. And so, you know, you can be well-meaning, but if you're coming from a point of view and a perspective that you lack the understanding then you're really missing the point. Mm -hmm. I mean, the zoo has an incredible program of dogs or has had dogs with elephants because the zoo staff understands 
the language of the dogs, the language of the elephants. And so, you know, it's, it's a groundbreaking, incredibly positive program. And very often those who make the, the most noise about them are those who simply do not understand the way these animals communicate. I mean, you probably know from horses, herding dogs are, are almost like a species unto themselves. Yeah. yeah. And so it's vital to understand the species before mm-hmm. you apply a particular point of view or program. So, so true. true. Uh, mm-hmm. So true. So true. Uh, I wish I could bring along with me when I meet with you a man by the name of Joe Bick, who came back from Iraq, a broken person, who mm-hmm. was a, a special ops uh, assassin for the United States, and learned that killing was um, exciting for him, and violence was part of his life, and and he soon had a court order that he couldn't go near his wife or children because of severe beatings that he gave them. And he came to one of my clinics, a broken human being that didn't know how my clinic might help him, but I had three days with him. And he left me on a Sunday evening and went home to Sonora, California and called his children. He got permission to talk to them on the phone. And that was Monday. On Tuesday, he met with the wife and children, and they had a coming to Jesus kind of meeting where they included me by telephone. And on Wednesday, they had a whole family meeting. And on Thursday, they had a re-wedding and a recommitment of vows. The family came back together. And the following Sunday, they, they came as a whole family here to the farm to each do join up and to see mm-hmm. what changed his life. And when you have that happen, man, you know, you mm-hmm. have a calling and you better answer the questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's, that's awesome, Monty. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, that's a horse sense and healing program. And, it, you know, we say the horses are the therapists and we really mean it. <laughs> well, we do mean it. I have to step back and say, how the hell did I do that? And I didn't <laughs> do it. The horses did it. The horses did it. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And we advocate for keeping horses in people's lives, but we're, we're in an echo chamber when we talk to horse people, right? So <clears throat> what I love about getting these messages out uh, to those people who don't understand is the power that we don't even understand yet that horses and flight animals yeah. contain so that we don't lose that even just in the in- daily interactions with healthy people. Uh, there is so much we can learn from the flight animal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why it's so exciting to meet two ladies like this yeah. who already already share these steps that we've taken and you know, three minds are better than one, and and um, I, I would just love to continue to explore. Let's do that. Let's do that. Are you open to that, Barbara? If we came out. Oh, absolutely. That would be awesome. Okay, Janet, you got to come with us. Without question, you. Know. Okay, good. <laughs> <My Good. Lord. laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. I've kept you a long time, but I think this was really important um, conversation to all quantify and put down so that we we keep ourselves accountable for 2018 to continue um, not working lonely and apart, but um, in a in an atmosphere of cooperation. Yeah, and Debbie, and Debbie, it's, it's almost four o'clock and Barbara has another commitment. So um, l- let's be fair with her and exactly. um, and let's exactly. put this on to another day. Okay. Very thank good. you very much. It was very, very nice talking with you, every one of you. I'm honored that I was invited to uh, to speak. Well, Happy to have, to have you. you here. Thank you both. Janet Rose, Barbara Baker, and Monty Roberts. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the herd. Dear Monty, why does my horse shake her head up and down while we are out riding? Monty's answer. 
While I am not one who quickly recommends equipment to solve problems with horses, I suggest that the use of a black iron bit with a copper inlaid in the mouthpiece is often helpful with a horse that habitually tosses her head. Once you have secured the proper mouthpiece, I then recommend a process of bidding up or mouthing, as outlined in my answer to an earlier question in this Ask Monty book, and further is described in my textbook from my hands to yours. I believe this will help the equestrian where head tossing is concerned. It is critical for every rider to understand that the human hands are usually the culprits in creating a horse that tosses his head. As equestrians, we should always look inward before blaming the horse. There are, in fact, several physical factors that may explain head tossing. There is a condition commonly called head shaking, which is a neurological disorder. When referring to this, scientists will describe a sharp up and down motion like a rapid nodding of the head with the nose slightly elevated. Head shakers are known to have a physical condition negatively affecting the atlas joint at the base of the skull. The atlas is the forerunner to the cervical vertebrae. This condition is not something you can fix with bits, hands, or training techniques. It is a disorder that requires medical diagnosis and attention. I have dealt with a number of head shakers in my career and have found that there is a genetic connection. It seems that certain families tend to produce head shakers more than others. There is another condition that is other than a training problem, and it is connected with certain pollen allergies. Some horses are allergic to pollens that come into contact with the mucous membranes of the nasal passages. It seems that when these particles touch these sensitive tissues, the horse tosses his head as if there were a significant tickling deep in the nose. To investigate the possibility of an allergy, find out if it's better to ride your horse on a certain day and or away from cut grass, trees, or certain fields. A nose net may help, and some creams make the nostrils less sensitive. Some people have found success with herbal remedies. Rapeseed, or canola as we call it in North America, definitely produces pollen that is irritating to the breathing passages of horses. Some UK property owners have conditions on their property deeds that forbid the production of rapeseed. These properties are generally in areas where horse training is a significant activity. One should call in a veterinarian to check if there is any potential physical problem. Once this has been accomplished, then in the absence of a medical solution, the owner should go to work with my recommendations as to this business of head tossing. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says, Get Free Horse Tips. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum. And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. March 3rd, he'll be back in Myers Co. College in England. And then March 7th, demonstration at Hadlow College. Been there before. That's really fun. March 17th, a demonstration at the Grange. That's with Martin Clunes. People from Devon will remember that. It's a wonderful show. And then March 24, he hops over to Ayers Island, which is Dublin, Ireland. And he's having fun again there. It's been a few years since he's been to Ireland. So March 24. And then we have an added date, March 28. Eighth, he's also going to be in the Guilford area. That's uh, in southeast England, and that's just been added to the calendar. So March twenty eighth, and then April twenty one, he hops back into California and right in the central area in Thousand Oaks, just north of L.A. He's going to be at the West Coast Dressage Convention. So we get back into the dressage crowd again. Really fun. And then May twenty three and twenty four, we have the movement. That's our symposium with our certified instructors 
and it's a festival. We have an awards dinner. Go online. You got to see this. It's the first annual ever, and it's going to be a life changer. May 25 to 27, we have a horse sense and healing back in the USA. Then hopping to July 23 through August 3, we have our gentling wild horse course at Flag is Up Farms. Those are so fun. And then August 6 through 10, we have Monty's special training. That's a once a year, and it's it's really fun. Wow. That's a lot going on. And if you do mm-hmm. not commit all of that to memory... You can find all that and more at MontyRoberts.com. Or if you want to chat with a real live human being, you can do that. You can call Flag is Up Farms by dialing 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, so much fun hearing about those exotic creatures and cool stuff going on in the movie birds business. You can find that at HorsemanshipRadio.com. And you'll find links and photos and more information about our guests And we love your feedback. The best way to do that is go to Facebook. Go to Facebook and type in Monty Roberts. And when that page pops up, it's the one with the little blue check mark. Like it. Follow it. Put on comments. Tell us what you want to hear about. Tell us what you enjoy on the show. It helps us make it better. And if you're a short and sweet kind of person, you can also follow Monty Roberts on Twitter. His handle is Monty underscore Roberts. And get the app. That way you'll never miss an episode on any of the Horse Radio Network shows. We have a free app for your Android or iPhone. Just go to your app store and search and type in there uh, Horse Radio Network. And you can download it today. It's quick. It's free. And it's easy. That's the way to do it. And many thanks to our sponsors, too. Omega Fields, Cavallo Horse and Rider, and MontyRobertsUniversity.com. And be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. <laughs> 